When I ask a Nerf veteran whether I can make blasters out of resin, they usually say something like, who are you and how long have you been in my bathtub? Nerfers just hate resin. They say it's too weak, it's too imprecise, and it's just not capable of printing competitive blasters. The truth is, far enough into this video for an algorithm to register high engagement, ha <laughs> ha! Nerf Warriors and Skeptical Airsofters, welcome to Void Star Lab. I am Zach Friedman, your Myth Blaster, if you will, and today I've set my sights, that's a pun, on one of modern Nerf's golden rules. If you want to print blasters, it's filament or nothing. We're going to send Superstition back to spawn by attempting to build not one, but two cutting-edge blasters, and we're going to do it out of pure resin. Can the preferred equipment of the Dungeon Master also put you on the Nerf battlefield? Let's find out. So why does resin have such a lousy reputation? Well, most resins are, oh, I'm supposed to be waving this bottle around. Well, most resins are formulated for detail, not the rigors of foam combat, and resin also has a nasty tendency to warp and deform during the printing and cleanup process. That skews dimensions and keeps blasters from coming together. The printers themselves are much smaller than filament machines, and very few of them can fit human scale designs at all. Finally, filament is wound onto neat, tidy spools, but but many resins, like many nerfers, are stinky toxic and require lots of alcohol to deal with. We need solutions to the first three, and I'm just going to suck it up on the fourth because you don't care about my comfort. You came here for educational entertainment, which we in the industry call entertational. Here's the plan. Imprimis, procure blaster models that will push resin to its limit. Secundus, upgrade our printing loadout to maximize our chances of a successful mission. Thirdundus, find a nerf military grade resin. And finally, we will put it all together by putting it all together. My very first nerf NERP episode featured a flywheel fan favorite, the Bulwark P90 style electric blaster by Jackrabbit Nerfer. It is not a bullpup because the action is in front of the trigger. The Bulwark is crammed with spring-loaded levers, intricate mechanisms, and a unique feeding system that'll all make it a real pain in the butt to print. I'm going to raise the stakes by building the dual stage version with a second set of flywheels that'll give it extra power, as long as the printer can keep all four motors aligned. For our Springer, I picked the latest iteration of Captain Slug's Caliburn, the most popular 3D bl blasted printer. Why am I having so much trouble with this? It packs the powerful K25 spring, which is able to feed darts 200 yeet per second. And my own filament Caliburns, like this one, have cracked dozens of times under its power. I built the previous version in my Nerf Sniper episode, but today we are going to make its successor, the Caliburn 4 or the C4. This thing is so cutting edge that yours truly will be only the second YouTuber to feature it. This design bolsters the build with beefy metal bars, and I've been told that they make what's already one of the sturdiest, most dependable blasters even sturdier and dependabler. If the resin introduces any slop to the system, it's got nowhere to hide, and combined with that evil, evil spring, will push our resin's mechanical properties to their limits. I reached out to Frontline Foam, the Utah-based purveyor of nerfing gear and custom-built blasters, so I could mooch today's parts, darts, and mags. If you get tempted by this arsenal, links are below. Speaking from experience, when you part out a blaster on McMaster, which rhymes, you end up spending like five times too much for like 10 times too many materials. Trust me, just get a kit. Thank you so much, Derek Sun and the Frontline Foam team. Next, we need equipment, and we need the good stuff. Most hobbyist resin printers use a tech technology called masked SLA, or as Canadian horn honkers call it, Libcuck face diaper SLA. These things make models by blasting a clear bottom vat of resin with an ultraviolet lamp, which is masked off by an LCD display. I know what I did. What you're seeing is not a simulation. This is actually what's being projected into the resin that does the fabrication. Anything black stays liquid, anything clear gets hard. The more light hits the resin, the harder the resin cures, the harder the resin cures, the less likely it is to warp and lose its definition when it's ripped off the vat. But if too much light manages to leak through the mask, you don't get details, you get mush. Blaster makers tend to design around a 22 cubic centimeter build envelope because that's what the best-selling filament printers have. But most resin printers are much smaller, only about 12 by 7 by 15 centimeters, so we're going to need to procure ourselves a jumbo printer just to keep up. 
Allow me to introduce the Photon Mono X6K, provided by the biggest name in hobbyist resin and the sponsor of today's episode, AnyCubic. The Mono X's oversized build envelope is 24 by 20 by 12 centimeters, and that can fit all but one part of both of today's blasters. Its 6K resolution is total overkill for chunky blaster parts, but this display has an exceptional contrast and is backed by powerful LEDs that should help preserve a blaster's critical dimensions. The Photon Mono X6K is so perfect for what we're trying to do today. It's almost like I got the printer first and then came up with the episode. Resin prints emerge partially cured, still soft, and dripping with excess resin. So I shook down any cubic for a wash and cure plus. Simply plunk the plate into the airtight tub of isopropanol and watch the magnetic stir jacuzzi away all the resin do. Swap it for a mirror and a turntable and this beautiful bastard bastes our blasters in 40 watts of photonic goodness which quickly brings them up to full strength. Eat my ass Alton Brown, sometimes you just need the frickin' unitasker. Links are in the description. Do it now. Now, don't think. Any Cubic also included a few bottles of their Craftsman resin, which produced beautiful prints, but it had a bit of a minor downside. This is acrylated epoxy. It's cheap, easy to print, great at fine details. Basically, it's the PLA of resin. The downsides are it's very adhesive, so it tends to warp as uh, the Z-axis rips it off the vat, and it's brittle, which is fine for D&D minis, because no respectable dungeon master lets the players survive an encounter. Soraya Tech is the finest resin purveyor that would return my calls. They specialize in semi-flexible, impact-resistant engineering resins, and our conversation went something like this. Hello, Soraya Tech. I'm going into nerf battle. I need your strongest resins. My strongest resins are too strong for you, YouTuber. My strongest resins could kill a beast. I got 280,000 subscribers. I'm practically a Mr. Beast. I'll go more into detail about the chemical and mechanical differences between different resins in the inevitable every resin video, like, comment, and subscribe, but to create a science-like narrative, I used each formula to make the Caliburn's most failure-prone parts, installed them, then dry-fired until something broke. Now, I've seen flat earthers with better experimental procedure, but here's the tier list. As expected, Craftsman Resin made brittle prints with prominent warping and distortion. <laughs> On the other hand, I like when they give me money. Honestly though, this just wasn't a fair fight. This isn't the right resin for the job. I'm putting this in C tier. The Siraya Build Resin produced crisp corners, smooth surfaces, and tight tolerances. Unfortunately, it wasn't much tougher than the Craftsman. I'm gonna give this a B tier for nerf, A tier for everything else, 3 out of 10 over rice. Next up is the blue. These parts came out clean, straight, and astonishingly blue. Even though I fired and I fired until my arm was as sore as when Brooke is out of town, nothing has so much as a chip. This gets an easy S tier. S for sh my arm hurts. Finally, the tenacious resin. The plunger stuck to the vat and left a gaping hole, and that was still the best print I managed to pull off in this stuff. I couldn't actually do a tenacious torture test because the parts warped so heavily they didn't even fit in the blaster. On the tier list, I got a rank tenacious D. In the end, I settled on a 5 to 1 mix of blue and tenacious. Blue seemed perfect on its own, but a dose of tenacious might prevent the screws from pulling out when I have to pistol whip someone. Sorry, Attack, let me grab your big old jugs. So we got our designs, the Bulwark and the Caliburn 4. We've picked our printer, the Photon Mono X6K. We got our resin cocktail, shaken not stirred, and now for the fun part, building the blasters. While FDM support material is more like scaffolds that like loosely prop saggy filament up, resin supports are more like chains that rip your model off the vat. You need more of them, and they have to be fused straight into the surface, so some prints come out scarred with blobby pockmarks. After wasting days running off prints as lumpy and misshapen as my chin is under my beard, I said screw the rules, and I printed them flat against the bed. I'm a mad lad, somebody stop me! I then discovered the biggest reason one does not simply print resin flat on the plate. You have to get it off afterwards with a chisel, which either destroys the bottom layer or it just bends the whole shebang. That's where I whipped out my secret weapon. This 
is the Wham Bam Flexible Build Surface, a magnetic spring steel plate that mounts on the Photon Mono's bed. Now, instead of bending the print off the plate, we can bend the plate off the print. It's gentle enough to keep the bottom layer intact and keeps us from twisting the model like a soft poisonous tortilla. But one problem turned out to be insurmountable. This blaster's loading mechanism is a rotor that strips a dart off the sideways mag and plows it down a 90 degree conveyor belt into the flywheels. Or at least it's supposed to, because this thing jammed more than that scene from Spaceballs with the jam that I can't actually show you because the employment of copyrighted material for illustrative purposes does not fall under fair use. Who even knows what I've pixelated here? As stupid as this sounds, my goal of printing these blasters in pure resin was stymied, not by a warped frame or a cracked cage, but by these tiny little rollers. You see, acrylic has a high coefficient of friction, somewhere around 0.4, and these are acrylic materials, so I couldn't even bunt by switching to a different resin. I couldn't grease these parts, because if any of it gets in the flywheels, they won't be able to grip darts anymore. I ended up printing the rollers in PVDF filament, a fluoropolymer with excellent lubricity, featured in my advanced filaments video. I still had to downgrade the pusher motor to a mere 20 darts per second to have enough torque to get them around the bend, but sacrifices must be made. The bulwark's instructions were a little bit sussy in the bussy, but I hacked it out, and now it's time to test. This frame is absolutely rock solid, and since layer lines are basically non-existent, the trigger, grips, and cheek rest are silky smooth. The details are crisp, like maybe even too crisp, because these edges on the trigger guard are sharp enough to give me paper cuts. Magazines latch in with a satisfying clunk, and the spring-assisted ejector kicks them back out. Something broke. This is one of the parts that I didn't print in blue because I was waiting for it to arrive. It gets about 150 FPS, which is about what you'd expect for a double stage blaster with hurricane wheels, but that's great. We want this thing to work as well with resin as it did with filament. The big downside is that this is heavy. This weighs almost as much as a caliber and which is pretty plump for a flywheeler. But what's indisputable is that resin went toe-to-toe -to -toe with filament and maybe even beat it. This is one of the most luxurious, premium-feeling blasters I have ever held, and it shoots pretty good too. An unexpected bonus is that unlike filament, resin doesn't soften as it heats up, which completely sidesteps a flywheel cage's most common mode of failure. But can resin hold up to the sheer power of the K25? I'm gonna clean the workbench first. It looks like a meth lab to micro center. Next up, the Caliburn. Captain Slug, living treasure of the Nerf community and card-carrying mechanical engineer, designed this blaster so that anyone with a hacksaw, screwdriver, wrench, and 3D printer can make one for themselves. That's why this free and open source masterpiece is held together by threaded rods. They're easy to buy and they're easy to cut, but they allow the blaster to twist and flex. So our international bomberman of mystery developed the Caliburn 4. This is a total rework that swapped those wobbly rods for drilled and tapped aluminum flat stock. The C4 is supposed to be stiffer, smoother, and straight up sexier than the previous generations, and resin could push that even further. The Big Big Mono X and the flexible build surface actually had a really easy time running this off. I found the whole process far friendlier than filament. Resin printers take a fixed amount of time to expose each layer, no matter how chunky the model is or what else you put on the plate. Printing time depends on nothing more than the tallest object, and since most of the Caliburn's parts are fairly squat, I managed to finish this blaster in less than half the time it takes to make a filament Caliburn. As soon as I started building this thing on stream, Mondays and Fridays, noon mountain time, 1700 UTC, twitch.tv slash Zach Friedman, I realized that I had something magical. In my past builds, touching up the prints is what took most of the assembly time, but this resin on this printer is so insanely accurate that a tiny bit of filing was all it took. I actually had to print some shims because the clearance was too good. Totally off topic, but Slug put the barrel flush with the muzzle. The worst nerfing injuries I have ever seen were caused by exposed metal barrels, and with the C4, Slug has quietly saved countless foreheads. Fucking legend. One new feature did not work. This collet is supposed to clamp the barrel in place, but between the loose fit and the stiffness of the resin, it just didn't do anything. One day, I'm going to reprint that collet in a more flexible material so I can give it the clamps! Meh! 
Like the bulwark, the lack of layer lines gives the furniture a soft, satiny finish. But in this case, it's not just about comfort. This is a muscle-powered blaster, and all that force is transmitted through your hands. So even tiny boogers on the grip or pump mean blisters by the end of a long war. Resin smoothness means more game time and less bleeding for my goddamn hands time. This video is running long, so I'm not going to get into the accessories, but suffice to say, when it comes to tacticalness, Resin wins. Filament layer lines add weak spots and friction, but resin is strong in all directions and high speed, low drag. I even gave my new blaster some cat ear iron sights. Blast me, daddy. Ooh, ooh. My pure resin caliber now looks submissive and breedable, but how does it feel? Feels pretty good, man. Between the super stiff resin and the new metal frame, this thing operates. It's solid, authoritative, professional. The pump stroke is buttery smooth, the sear locks the plunger with a definitive and between the super stiff mechanisms and frontline foams, Delrin plunger, the trigger pull is extra crispy. I wouldn't say it's perfect. The loose fit gives the pump a bit of play and a bunch of pieces jiggle more than I like. Also, Slug's love of elastic paracord makes me a little uncomfortable, but this is one of the most stable rock solid springers I have ever spent time with. Give me the numbers, Friedman. <laughs> About that. Uh, due to a production hang up, frontline foam couldn't send me the lathe turned aluminum ram core in time for this episode. The ram core is the part that shoves a dart into the business end and pipes the pressurized air behind it. It's, it's kind of important. I designed and printed a quick and dirty resin version, but to keep it strong, I had to make it a little more restrictive than the real deal. This thing still pews at 180 feet per second, which is below a caliber and 200-225 FPS, but I doubt this is the blaster itself. Once the bolt is closed, the only printed part in play is the ram base, and its only job is to get a plunger smacked into it. But the numbers are a good sign. These shots are within just a few feet per second of each other, and predictability is what lets you improve your aim over the long term. And bonus, this thing hasn't broken yet. This episode's themes were supposed to be frustration, jank, and a lot of slow motion shots of blaster internals eating shit. But the end products don't just look and feel great, they work great, and uh, I'm confident they're tough enough to hold up to some intense nerf combat. Parts like grips, flywheel cages, and tactical accessories might be even better printed in resin. So is filament better for blasters? On balance, it's, it's probably better than resin. Uh, but does this mean that those with a resin printer need to go out and buy a new machine? Perhaps not. Myth blasted. Thank you so much to Anycubic for sponsoring the episode and for providing the Photon Mono X6K, Wash and Cure Plus, and Craftsman Resin. Also, big shout out to Frontline Foam for hooking me up with the parts kits and supplying the Nerf internet community. You can get all this gear, all the parts, and the resin in the description below. And speaking of resin... Inconceivable! My strongest resins are too strong for a man! What is the source of your unholy strength? Resin seller, my strength comes not from my resin, but from the support of our patrons. My collaborators include, Reagan says the US Space Force trains at their Space Force Training and Readiness Command, Star Command. Jeremy Arnold, Schweddy Vag, Chuck Faduk, Small Dong, Command, and Brian D. Swollen Nut. I have inscribed their names upon today's episode in the utmost of stealth. Shall you be willing to quest for them? My strongest resins are too strong for even six humans. Resin seller, I'm joined in battle by my lab assistants. My party includes the Antifa, Taranak, Vinayaka Patrick Thompson, the Cuttlefish, Nino Gansitano, Buffalo, 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 Zoster, Bill Schooler, One Handful of Beans, Void Warranties, Dwarn Antwerpen, TKMK, C. Harris, Azundo, Wielder of Iron, Heater of Shrink, Achalia, I just bought another 3D printer, Do. Oh! Burbiser did nothing wrong yet. Powerful CCH, Ashley Coleman, SXP, Bob Dobbington, My Dog is a Bear, Caster the Catboy, Granville Schmidt, Arrow Raider, Nathan Johnson, Michael Roche, Zanforian, Clunge Bob Squirtpants, Roger Pinkham of the Great Star Theater, Trans Rights, Victor Vaughn, William Drescher, Curb, Sir Derpington of Derptopia, Brad Cox, DSA, Ethan Gomes, Zach. 
protagonist, Rusty Flute, on all levels except physical, I am a lioness, Philip, period clots, good suck, Kevin Graf, Varka, the world's greatest drone pilot, Bachrinder FPV, Boulder Yard Creek, James, wait, nope, Boulder Creek Yard, James, it's 2022 and I met my girlfriend out of my little pony convention, Cats, Burren Duck 3, Crone Home of the Mysterious Glyphs, Isekai Elf Mahiro Chan Desione, Eddie, Epon Man, Lydia K, Talon Democratic Socialist, and a pretty righteous dude, Zach, and Good Lady Nat, Queen of Lemons, Victor of the Great Citrus Wars. Lemons? In our next installment, we're going to make our own circuit boards right here in Void Star Lab. Hit subscribe, wear a respirator, thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the battlefield.